www.thepowerhouse.com. Good morning. Welcome to the Position Update. My name is Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, as always. And uh, being Monday morning, we'll return where we left off Friday on the broadcast in the book, A Woman Rides a Beast by Dave Hunt. We're currently in the chapter entitled, The Coming New World Order. And Dave was discussing for us Mariology and Mariolatry and what role Mary and the Roman Catholic Church will play in the New World Order. What role will this universal goddess that appeals to all the religions of the world, that which the Roman Catholic Church calls Mary, what role will she play in the coming New World Order in the global religion under the Antichrist? I'm backing up just a few paragraphs for continuity uh, this morning, and we'll begin uh, about the middle of page 457, if you're reading along in your own copy of the book. Dave says, Mary, a goddess suitable for all religions, is already adored by a quarter of the Earth's population. Moreover, her ability to command the loyalty of multitudes has been demonstrated on a national level for centuries. Quote, Mary was, quote, declared queen of the Ukrainian people, unquote, in 1037, and Hungary was dedicated to her, to her by King St. Stephen at about the same time. Quote, Richard II solemnly consecrated England to Mary as her dowry in 1381. Unquote. France was consecrated to Mary in 1638 by the order of Louis XIII, who said, quote, We consecrate to her particularly our person, our state, our crown, and our subjects. Unquote. Poland in 1656 by King Casimir. All of the, quote, South American Spanish colonies were dedicated to Mary through a solemn consecration in 1643 at the command of King Philip IV, unquote. And in 1664, the same, quote, was done for Portugal and all her colonies at the instigation of King John IV, Austria, the following year unquote, etc. In 1846, the bishops of America wrote, quote, We place ourselves and all entrusted to our charge under the special patronage of the Holy Mother of God, unquote. Now, just as a bit of enlightenment, I will include that these bishops of the Roman Catholic Church in America who consecrated to Mary those who are entrusted to their charge literally means every man, woman, and child in this country. The bishops of the Roman Catholic Church observe the same divine right and universal ruling status as the Pope who sits in Rome, who claims to be the vicar, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And so, without explicitly stating it, they use words that mean the same thing. Quote, We place ourselves and all entrusted to our charge under the special patronage of the Holy Mother of God. Unquote. Now, where we left off on the program Friday, subtitled Mary and Islam. What role does Mary play in Islam? You'll find this interesting if you're not already aware of it. Dave said it is easy to imagine Buddhists, Hindus, New Agers, and liberals, as well as both Catholics and Protestants, 
uniting in a world religion. But the billion, uh, the billion Muslims pose a special problem. Mary, however, seems to be the unique one through whom even they could be united in a universal faith. A British Catholic magazine reports that, quote, a Marian revival is spreading throughout Africa, with alleged apparitions of the Virgin Mary finding a following among Muslims, unquote. African Muslims themselves are seeing apparitions of the Virgin Mary and, quote, are not required to become Christians, unquote, to follow her. Our Sunday visitor pointed out the honor given to Mary in Islam's Quran and the intriguing connection between her and Muhammad's favorite daughter, Fatima. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen wrote an interesting book in which he predicted that Islam would be converted to Christianity, quote, through a summoning of the Muslims to a veneration of the Mother of God, unquote. He reasoned this way. He said, quote, The Quran has many passages concerning the Blessed Virgin. First of all, the Quran believes in her immaculate conception and also in her virgin birth. Mary, then, is for the Muslim the true Sayyida, or Lady. The only possible serious rival to her in their creed would be Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad himself. But after the death of Fatima, Muhammad wrote, quote, Thou shalt be the most blessed of all women in paradise after Mary, unquote. Sheen goes on to say how remarkable it was that Our Lady had the foresight to appear in the Portuguese village of Fatima, which is named after Muhammad's daughter during the Muslim occupation, and it says, thus became known as Our Lady of Fatima. It is a fact that when a statue of Our Lady of Fatima is carried through Muslim areas in Africa, India, and elsewhere, Muslims turn out by the hundreds of thousands to worship her. In two days, an estimated 500,000 came to give their respects to this idol in Bombay, India. Did you realize that the common link, the lowest common denominator of virtually every religion in the world today, except true Bible Protestantism, is a belief in a mother goddess. You'll find it in every culture. And it's not to be surprising that it's not found in the true faith of Jesus Christ. What role will Mary play, this mother goddess in the New World Order? Subtitled Mary and John Paul II, Dave writes... No one is more convinced of the validity of the Fatima visitations than the present Pope, John Paul II. Nor is anyone more devoted to Mary. Pope John Paul II, who has, quote, dedicated himself and his pontificate to Our Lady, unquote, bears the letter M for Mary in his coat of arms, his personal motto embroidered on the inside of his robes in Latin is Totus Tuus Sum Maria, which means Mary, I'm all yours. The Pope has unusual personal reasons for his special devotion. The assault upon his life occurred on May 13, 1981, the anniversary of the Virgin's alleged first appearance on May 13, 1917, at Fatima, Portugal. In a vision during his convalescence, she told him that she had spared his life for a special mission he must fulfill in bringing peace. Returning to the Vatican after his recovery, Pope John Paul II prayed at the tombs of his immediate predecessors and declared, quote, There could have been another tomb, but the Blessed Virgin has willed otherwise, unquote. He added carefully and reverently, quote, For everything that happened to me on that day, I felt that extraordinary motherly protection and care, 
which turned out to be stronger than the deadly bullets, unquote. Well, why would you need God when you have Mary's protection, right? See how they deify Mary? The thankful Pope made a solemn pilgrimage to Fatima on May 13, 1982, where he, quote, prayed before the statue of Our Lady of Fatima. Thousands heard him speak and consecrate the world to Mary as she had requested, unquote. At one, excuse me, on at least three other occasions, on October 16, 1983, on March 25, 1984, and on December 8, 1985, Pope John Paul II consecrated the world to, quote-unquote, Our Lady, with special mention of the Russian people. Now that the Berlin Wall has come down and Soviet communism has unraveled throughout Eastern Europe, credit is being given to Our Lady of Fatima for fulfilling her promise that if the popes and the bishops would consecrate the world and Russia to her immac immaculate heart, quote, my immaculate heart will triumph. Russia will be converted and there will be peace, unquote. Such a statement is in the fullest opposition to the clear teaching of the Bible, which offers, quote, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1, as a free gift of God's grace, a peace that was bought through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. Individual peace comes by faith to all who believe the gospel. World peace will only be established when Christ returns to reign from Jerusalem as the prophets foretold. Yet Catholicism's Mary has taken the place of Christ as the one through whom peace will come, and the present Pope and his church support this, his, this heresy. Today's world, including those who call themselves Christians, is only too willing to accept a solution to, this, to its problems that leave out Christ. That the woman is astride the beast seems to indicate that this pseudo-Mary of the apparitions will play a key role in the false peace by which Antichrist, quote, shall destroy many, unquote, Daniel 8.25. Declaring that the Lord had, quote, confided the peace of the world to her, unquote, the apparition that appeared as the Virgin of Fatima offered its own peace plan in the place of Christ. Quote, Say the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world. Pray, pray a great deal, and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices and pray for them. God wishes to establish in the world the devotion to my immaculate heart. If people do what I tell you, many souls will be saved and there will be peace, unquote. Souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices? Christ has already made the only saving sacrifice. Under the subtitle, A Seducing Spirit, Dave writes, Here's a blatant denial, accepted and promoted by Rome, that Christ's sacrifice paid the full debt for sin. Every pope in the last 60 years has honored Our Lady of Fatima. Devotion to a mythical, immaculate heart substitutes for devotion to God and Christ, and obedience to Our Lady brings peace. The apparition is surely not Mary. Claiming for itself the authority and attributes of Christ, the apparition of Fatima also declared, quote, I will never leave you. Dave reminds us, this is the promise of Christ to his disciples, and it presupposes omnipresence, an attribute of God alone. Mary further says, My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. Sacrifice yourselves for the conversion of sinners. And Dave includes a note, 
Only Christ's sacrifice avails for sinners. Mary continues, And in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I promise to assist in the hour of death with all the graces necessary for salvation all those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, go to confession and receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary, and keep me company for a quarter of an hour while meditating on the mysteries of the rosary with the intention of making reparation to me, unquote. This counterfeit Mary's offer of, quote, the graces necessary for salvation, unquote, and her promise to, quote, lead you to God, unquote, is one more denial of the sufficiency of Christ's finished work upon the cross, a denial which is implicit in Roman Catholic dogma and rituals. It is to Mary's heart that the world must make reparation for the evil it has done against her. Another blasphemous teaching. David said, quote, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. Psalm uh, 51.4 Sin is against God, not against any of his creatures. Thus to teach that reparation must be made to Mary for sins against her is again to put her in the place of God. This elevation of the woman not only fits John's vision, but also blends paganism and Christianity as foretold. Quote, Say the rosary every day to obtain peace, unquote. A popular Catholic television program advertises, quote, There's no problem that, can be, that cannot be solved with the rosary, unquote, and gives an 800 number to call for further information. To say the rosary, one must repeat the Lord's Prayer, and, quote, Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unquote, six times each, and the, quote, Hail Mary, full of grace, 53 times. Yes, the woman dominates. The world is being prepared for the one who rides the beast, and even evangelical leaders and their flocks are being deceived. One popular evangelical prophecy expert, known for his Bible memorization, repeatedly praises the Pope on TV and quotes, quote, Our Lady of Fatima, unquote, as though she speaks the truth. And who is this very popular Bible memorization uh, teacher on television? His name is Jack Ben Impey. Jack Ben Impey, who I used to revere for his ability to quote Scripture. It, to me, it seemed that he had the entire Bible memorized. And at the blink of an eye, he could quote any scripture in the Bible. I used to watch his program faithfully until one day, while watching his program, he held up a copy of the Roman Catholic Catechism, held it in front of the camera, and shook it. And he said, this is the Word of God. And that's when Jack Van Impey and I departed company. Now, Dave Hunt continues. He says, clearly, these apparitions oppose the biblical gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the finished sacrifice of Christ and glorify a counterfeit Mary in his place. A, quote, seducing spirit, unquote, 1 Timothy 4.1, is at work. Yet John Paul too has said, quote, The message of Fatima is addressed to every human being and is more relevant and more urgent than ever, unquote. The offer of a pseudo-peace is, is given by apparitions everywhere. Consider the following ad in the Dallas Morning News by the local, quote, Queen of Peace Center, unquote. Quoting, 
prescription for peace, a voice cries out in the wilderness, a woman's. This event has been reported in the New York Times, 2020, Life, Time Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal, etc. Millions of people have visited this site, and most have returned home with a renewed faith in God, peace in their hearts, and a desire to live the gospel message. We're talking about the appearance of the Virgin Mary in Medjugorje, Bosnia, Herzegovina, as well as dozens of locations around the world. Why the Virgin Mary? The Blessed Virgin Mary was the vessel that brought Jesus into the world the first time. It could be that she is heralding his second coming. Besides, by first creating peace within our own hearts, she says, then in your families and in the world, unquote. You see how they deified Mary and put her in place of Christ, and there's not one word of mention of any of this in the Bible. The great apostasy, Catholicism's Jesus, subordinate to Mary. The apparitions are given credit for pointing people to Jesus, yet there's little sign of real devotion to Christ among the pilgrims of Marian shrines. It is Mary who, is, who has the honor. The rosary is prayed over and over. The talk is all about Mary rather than Christ or God. The devotion is to her, and pilgrims see themselves as her servants doing her bidding. Mary, not Christ, is the one who will, be, who will bring peace, according to them. It is her peace plan for the world. Reparation must be made to her for the sins committed against her, and she must hold back the hand of her son from judgment. Mary, not Christ, is glorified. Moreover, the Jesus promoted in the apparitions is a counterfeit who is always subordinate to Mary. The visions of Mary at Fatima, Portugal, which have meant so much to all of the popes since then, and especially Pope John Paul II, are very explicit in their diminution of Christ and the elevation of Mary in his place. The false gospel of salvation through Mary is even endorsed by a demon posing as Jesus who accompanies Mary. The official account of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima declares, quote, On the 10th of December, 1925, the Most Holy Virgin Mary appeared to Lucia with the child Jesus by her side, elevated on a cloud of light. Dave Hunt reminds us, Jesus is no longer a child. Our Lady rested one hand on Lucia's shoulder, while on the other hand she held a heart surrounded with sharp thorns. At the same time, the child Jesus spoke, quote, have pity on the heart of my most holy mother. It is covered with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to remove them with an act of reparation, unquote. On February 15, 1926, the child Jesus appeared again and urged Catholics to, quote, spread this devotion of reparation to the Immaculate Heart of his mother, declaring that reparation must be made to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for mankind to be saved. Here again is blasphemy of the worst kind. It would never be uttered by the real Mary or by Jesus. We'll continue with the reading of the book, A Woman Rides a Beast by Dave Hunt. We'll return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Welcome back from the break. We'll continue where we left off before the break. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says on February 15, 1926, quote, the child Jesus, unquote, appeared again and urged Catholics to, quote, spread this devotion of and reparations to the Immaculate Heart of His Mother, unquote, 
declaring that reparation must be made to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for mankind to be saved. Here again is blasphemy of the worst kind. It would never be uttered by the real Mary or by Jesus. Christ is no longer a child, and thus could not possibly appear in that form. And why should he even if he could? A mature man, when he died for our sins, he is now in a resurrected, glorified body at the Father's right hand. It defies all bounds of rational thought and reality to imagine that Christ is still a babe accompanying his mother. Yet those who find no problem believing that millions of different wafers can each be the true physical body of Christ, whole and entire, have no difficulty believing that Christ, while a mature man in heaven in his resurrected body, can and does at the same time appear as a babe on earth. Furthermore, the real Jesus, after his resurrection, told his disciples that, quote, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. See Luke chapter 24, verse 47. In his preaching, Paul declared that, quote, through this man, Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, not Mary, by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. The Bible contains no hint of reparation being made to Mary much less that this is essential, quote, for mankind to be saved, unquote. All of the apparitions boldly offer a false gospel of salvation through Mary, and the, un and the usual sacramental Catholicism of purgatory, ritual, and works. Quote, Our Lady of Medjugorje, he said, quote, there are many souls who have been in purgatory for a long time because no one prays for them. God has placed his complete trust in me. I particularly protect those who have been consecrated to me. At Christmas, the greatest number of souls leave purgatory. They, there are in purgatory souls who pray ardently to God and God permits them to manifest themselves to their relatives on earth in order to remind them of the existence of purgatory. These are all quotes from Mary over a period of years, none of which can be validated in the Scripture. Clearly, this is another gospel and another Christ. And it calls itself Christianity and it has deceived the whole world. Dave says, Clearly we are seeing what Paul warned would occur in the last days. Quote, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4.1 What these apparitions teach are definitely doctrines of devils that deny the sufficiency of Christ's death for our sins that deny his position as Lord of all and exalt a false Mary above him. She becomes the way to Jesus and the door to heaven, standard Catholic doctrine, but it's not biblical. Typical is the following excerpt from a letter from the office of the bishop, Diocese of San Angelo, Texas, concerning a shrine to be built to, quote, Our Lady of Guadalupe, unquote. Here's what it says. When our Blessed Mother appeared to Juan Diego on the hill of Tepeyac in 1531, Mary asked that a shrine be built to her honor, so that through her, God's love, compassion, help, and assistance could be poured out on the pilgrims who would come to this sacred place. 
Let us pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit and ask our Blessed Mother to give her give us her guidance. Signed, your servants in Christ and Mary, Most Reverend Michael D. Pfeiffer, OMI, Bishop of San Angelo, and Reverend Domingo Estrada, OMI, Pastor, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Unquote. The shrine offering slip in close. Yes, I want to help build a shrine in honor of our Blessed Mother so all can be comforted by her presence, unquote. But earlier shrines to Our Lady of Guadalupe exist. There are thousands of Marian shrines all around the world. Can her presence be at all of them simultaneously? She would have to be God for that to be true. In fact, the Catholic Mary promises to be with each individual Catholic worldwide. It is undeniable that Catholics look to Mary as though she were even greater than God and certainly more merciful and likely to favor them than God or Christ. As goddesses dominated in the past, so this goddess will play a dominant role in the immediate future. Under the subtitle, Ancient Rome's Religion Revived, this is the key to the Roman Catholic religion. Listen carefully. Clearly, along with a worldwide revival under Antichrist of the Roman Empire, there will be a revival of its religion, which, as we have seen, was paganism surviving under a thin veneer of Christian terminology. This is exactly why the Bible calls it Babylon the Great. It eventually became known as Roman Catholicism. Statues of the fertility goddess were renamed Mary. If you weren't aware of these facts, they are true and verifiable. The the goddess that they called Mary was the images and idols of the goddess that Roman Catholicism now calls Mary was venerated to Diana and other female deities of paganism in Rome's <clears throat> pagan past. They simply rebaptized and renamed these statues. It says, images had been made of the Roman emperors and all who refused to bow down to the images and worship the emperors as gods were killed. As the successors to the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman emperors, the popes also killed those who refused allegiance to them and their religion. This is irrefutable history, which the Bible says will repeat itself under Antichrist. I want to state it another way. Pagan Rome simply became baptized. It continued under the name Christianity. And that's a reality that will sink in if one is willing to do the research in the matter and really investigate Roman Catholicism and what it teaches. Quote, They will make an image to the beast and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 and 15. Now Dave says something extraordinary here, and I'm going to read it as it's written but it is fully explained in the fact that Dave Hunt was a futurist. He did not understand the 27th verse of Daniel chapter 9. He believed that verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9 spoke of a future Antichrist and a future causing of the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Dave Hunt failed 
to realize that that verse speaks of not of Antichrist, but of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And so Dave Hunt went to his grave expecting a future Antichrist and failed to recognize the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible. Dave Hunt, for all his well-meaning, was simply not a Protestant. He lost his, his claim to Protestantism when he departed from Protestant teaching. That is the historical understanding of the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, in Jesus Christ. And that because it speaks not of Antichrist, that verse, Dave was then allowed to believe the futurist lie that Antichrist is a single individual that arises at the very end of time before Christ's return. And that blinded him to the reality, the biblical, historical, and prophetic reality that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, here is his extraordinary statement. A pope will not be the Antichrist. What, but will be his right-hand man, the false prophet of Revelation 13, verse 11 through 17, 19, uh, verse 20, and 20, verse 10. Dave Hunt could only have made that statement were he convinced of the Jesuit futurism taught by Rivera and Bellarmine. He believed that the Antichrist was a future individual. And he failed to recognize the papacy as the Antichrist. All of this in spite of all the other truths that he's told about the papacy in this book. Even then, knowing all of that, the history of the popes, he claimed that the pope is not the Antichrist. Again, he says, a pope will not be the Antichrist, but will be his right-hand man, the false prophet of Revelation 13, 11, 17, 19, verse 20, 20, verse 10. At current papal appearances, however, now here's where he's obviously going to contradict himself. Listen to what he says. At current papal appearances, however, one observes adoration like that which the world will give Antichrist when it worships him as God. There's the truth, Dave. Were he alive, I could attempt to show him his own words. At papal, he says, the Pope is not the Antichrist, but one of, but, but, it says, uh, however, <laughs> one observes adoration of the Pope like that which will be given Antichrist when it worships him as God. Listen to what he says. He's talking about a specific worship that Pope John Paul II received in 1993. A worship that Dave Hunt would expect to be given to the Antichrist, the future Antichrist, when he rules and reigns. He says, he says, at papal, at, at, excuse me, at current papal appearances, however, one observes adoration, that is worship, like that which the world will give Antichrist when it worships him as God. Consider this eyewitness account from 19, the 1993 World Youth Day in Denver. Pilgrims who had, who had fasted and walked the 15 miles to Cherry Creek Park 
for an all-night vigil before, quote, Our Lady of the New Advent, unquote, awaited the Pope's return the next morning. What followed was almost terrifying to the few Christians present. Quote, Suddenly, the whirring of the white-topped helicopters heard above the music. Quote, It's the Pope! Papa! Unquote. The crowd becomes ecstatic. People press forward. Some are clutching rosaries, crying. Others cheer. The orchestra begins the Abba Oistie fanfare, a special tune that the Pope loves. The crowd's noise now is deafening as the small figure of Pope John Paul II walks onto the stage, smiles and waves to the crowd. The adoration of this man by these people is amazing to behold. In his presence, people lose ordinary defenses. They are vulnerable under his high-caliber, quote-unquote, spirituality. He smiles with approving eyes, hugging and kissing those he can reach. John Paul II, in his white attire, approaches the steps leading to his chair, a throne-like structure of oak. He waves again to the standing pilgrims, then climbs the steps and sits down. The music continues softly as a young person from the International Youth Forum reads from offstage, quote, Behold a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, unquote. The implication of that particular scripture in this setting induces a sense of alarm and dread from Protestants. The scriptures from Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 and previews of view of Christ on his throne in heaven, quote, the great multitude which no man could number, unquote, is the true church, the bride. However, at Cherry Creek Park, the Pope sits on a throne among youth of many nations and tongues. They cry out to him as this scripture is read. Is this Pope insinuating that he is Christ on his throne? and the youth below are his sheep? The arrogance is overpowering, despite John Paul II's seeming humility. However, those unaware of Scripture and the translated meaning of the Polish hymn neither see nor sense arrogance. They see and sense love. Pope John Paul II definitely has an enormous spirit of seductiveness, responding to Abba Father, while sitting in white vestments on a throne. Youths dressed in native costumes and representing each of the continents come forward carrying their national flags. They proceed up the center steps and place their flags at the podium, literally at Pope John Paul II's feet, unquote. And Dave Hunt says, Ironically, they treat the Pope like they will treat the Antichrist when he comes to rule. Incredible that Dave Hunt, in spite of all he knew, failed to recognize the Protestant reality that the Pope the papacy, and only the papacy, fulfills all the prophecies of the Bible regarding Antichrist, and there's no single Antichrist that can be called the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the papacy. It has been fulfilling all the prophecies of the Antichrist of the Bible since its very foundation almost two millennia. 
That's what we get for forgetting Protestantism and the false teaching, a Jesuit teaching nonetheless, the most powerful deception since the Garden of Eden, Jesuit futurism. Futurism, the idea that Antichrist is a single individual and doesn't come till seven years before Christ's return, a simple and very superficial twisting of the clear text of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The reality is that Christ fulfilled that prophecy completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> and it's because of that simple perversion. Failure to remember that it was Jesus who fulfilled that prophecy, they've attributed it to a future single Antichrist. And, of course, if Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years before Christ returns, then that exonerates the papacy and all of its history. That's why our schools here in the United States, even our Protestant churches, have removed true Protestant literature from its shelves. Nowhere in this country can it be found the historical fulfillment of Antichrist in the papacy. Because now it's believed to be heresy. If Antichrist is a single individual that comes at the end of time, then to teach that the papacy, the seat of Antichrist, the throne of the synagogue of Satan occupied by the papacy, is, was, and always will be the Antichrist is heresy. That means Protestantism is heresy because that was the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation. Were it not for the reality, the belief, the knowledge, the scripturally backed truth, the historically verified truth, that the papacy and only the papacy fulfilled the role of Antichrist in the world, were it not for that truth, there would not have been a Protestant Reformation. So literally, because belief in the, in the futurist interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Protestantism has been slain. It's dead. Stick a fork in it, it's dead. And now you know why the Pope is allowed freely to pursue his new world order. And now you know why Mary calls for reparations to her. Reparations for what? Reparations for overturning the chair of Antichrist at the Protestant Reformation for overthrowing all of the papal governments that ruled Europe with a rod of iron and trampled the people of God with the feet of iron, Roman iron. And now Rome is, is ready to reconstruct herself and continue her destructive march over the flesh of God's people in the New World Order, just as he did in the Old World Order. It's an incredible reality. I don't know if many of the listeners of my program are able to comprehend just how subtly and tactfully and successfully the Jesuits have overturned the Protestant Reformation simply by changing the identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. How easy it was to overturn the Protestant Reformation. All the churches that once called themselves Protestants now repudiate the term, calling themselves anything but Protestant, saying that they want to remove Protestantism from their vocabulary. Why? Because they no longer believe it's the papacy. They believe like Dave Hunt. 
that is just a single individual that will return or that will set up his image in Jerusalem and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And it's all going to be fulfilled manually by the real Antichrist, the Pope of Rome.